All right, I think we are ready. I'd like to welcome everyone to our session this afternoon. Our topic today is delivering on the promise of connected manufacturing. I'm Gary Cassell, uh, industry lead for manufacturing and automotive at Appian. And I'm very pleased and excited to have uh, with me today, Chris Frias joining the uh, discussion. And Chris is with Corvo, a large and leading manufacturer of RF solutions. And Chris, if you would, uh, please introduce yourself and maybe you know, give a little bit of just background on you know, your role in leading automation at Corvo. Sure, thanks, Gary. So my background is uh, an engineering background and specifically double E. And at Corvo, probably like many others, we had a lot of these back-end human-centric uh, business processes. And we knew we wanted to make some improvements, make it more efficient, throw in that word automation. But we were limited to just having a few engineering folks. And we didn't have a large IT army at our disposal. So this was back in 2012 when Appian and everything was using the word BPM. And so our problem was we needed a way to automate these human business processes. And they were, had some of the characteristics that many of the other p processes out there probably had. They were slow uh, because there was lots of manual translation. They were error prone. It's you take some piece of information that you get from one system, turn the chair into it, enter it into another, and it just wasn't scalable. If you wanted to do more, you had to hire more people, and it, it just didn't work. And uh, so I'll walk you through uh, the situation that uh, we wanted to uh, automate by giving a little bit of walkthrough. And instead of using some of the industry-specific terms and the acronyms that have to do with uh, the design and semiconductor, I'll just use regular old terms. That way they can make sense to, to you. So we're in a manufacturing space, and we build semiconductor integrated chips. And the way that we do that is we start out with these things that are called raw wafers. They look like little, almost like uh, discs or uh, CDs. And they start out as, if you can imagine, if you're building an ice sculpture. An ice sculpture, it starts out as a block of ice, and it gets operated on. You got the guy with the chainsaw or the chisel, and he's operating on it. And it, at the end, it's still ice but it's also something much more and something much more valuable. And that's what we do to these raw wafers. We send them through this uh, wafer manufacturing and it's like an assembly line where it starts at one step. Maybe if you can imagine the cars going through the assembly line at some of the big automotive manufacturers. And at the end of all of the 100 steps, it's a, it's a final product. And for us, the final product are these finished wafers and on them, each one of those little squares on there is a integrated circuit, and here we'll call them widgets. And there's thousands and thousands of widgets on that uh, finished wafer. And the problem for us is we build custom products. So on these different uh, wafers, some will contain widgets, some will contain doohickeys, some will contain thingamajigs, foo bars, all different kinds of integrated circuits. And that's where Appian came in to be powerful for us. Um, and then what made it even more complicated is we might be making different doohickeys, thingamajigs, food bars, depending on the situation, but then we go another level. Like for example, we might be making green doohickeys or red small doohickeys or purple thingamajigs uh, or yellow thingamajigs. And then so that whole configuration process for us is it was all of those uh, words that I described earlier and we needed a way to, to make that more efficient, less error prone, all of those buzzwords. And we use Appian to help us, guide us through this uh, whole flow of our customer facing uh, interfaces that ask, well, what kind of product do you want? Well, I want a doohickey. What kind of doohickey do you want? Uh, do you want a regular one, green one, big, small, other? And all of our customizable specifications, we use the workflow and the interfaces to guide us through that. And at the end, what we come out with are whatever configuration the customer went through in our workflow, we feed that as a recipe to our manufacturing plant, and our manufacturing plant knows exactly how to take all of these inputs and build it, and at the end, we get the, the final result for our customer. And so that's, that's, that's how we came about in 2012, 
figuring out what we need to do and uh, use Appian for. Yeah, great. So this, this really does parallel, and, and I wanted to share a little bit about connected manufacturing and some of the, the trends that we see in the industry and the momentum that's really been driven to digitize and automate. So it, it really parallels what Chris was talking about. So think about connected manufacturing as you know, this business strategy to actually connect and make use of both operational and business data to drive those efficiencies, to drive better product quality, um, you know, to actually connect partners into whether it's the design piece, those partners can be suppliers, they can be customers. Uh, as Chris talked about, a lot of the customization work that Corvo does is you, know, you can drive efficiency by having your business ecosystem actually be, bring those partners into, uh, into the mix. And you know, as, as I think about what it takes to realize a connected manufacturing strategy, you know, it really takes automation. And it takes you know, the, uh, the ability of, a let's say, a platform or tool to enable customers to digitize and automate processes as well as connect that data across you know, very different systems in their, their business ecosystem. I like statistics, so I always like to share a few with everyone just to, because I think this really highlights the momentum that's happened over the last couple of years and where manufacturers are really investing in this digitization and these automation strategies. The source of uh, these three statistics I'll share at this point, I may have some later because I really do like statistics. But, uh, you know, and, and this, this comes from a Forrester uh, survey, so a couple of statistics I'll share from Forrester Consulting uh, Survey, and it was a broad array of large uh, manufacturing and supply chain leaders that this, uh, this survey happened with, as well as just one statistic I think is quite interesting and also shows the change in momentum over the past couple of years in these uh, in this digitization and automation technology investment that manufacturers are making. But in the, the Forrester survey, um, the, the leaders actually responded. 80% of the respondents in that survey said that digital transformation of their operation and supply chain was their top priority. Pretty large number for such a large sample that uh, this was a, a worldwide sample that Forrester actually uh, surveyed. 67% of those surveyed stated that they, were, they had either already accelerated or were accelerating their digital transformation efforts. And from the Gartner survey, and I think this one's pretty interesting, so the 23% may sound small, but I'll, I'll give you the significance after I give you this number. So, 23% of those surveyed in, in the Gartner survey expect to have a full digital ecosystem of their business by year 2025. That is actually, the significance of that is that one year prior to the survey, only 1% made that statement. So a huge change um, that occurred there. So I'll, I'll kind of come back to, uh, to Chris with sort of my, my next question. Um, with, with those thoughts in mind, but Corvo's been a, a customer of Appian now for about 11 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through the time that you've been kind of leading these, uh, these automation efforts, can you talk a bit about some of the successes uh, that, that you've seen or experienced using the Appian low-code automation platform to really drive business results at Corvo? Right, so the example that I went through is our, is our first big win. And the success there was the digitization part. And prior to that, it was very analog, uh, difficult to measure. And when, it's diff when you don't, aren't able to measure it, in my experience, it's hard to improve it. And in doing that way, in the semi-manufacturing industry, we like metrics. And so yeah. we like to say our metric is we're going to do this particular job in 14 days and then we measure ourselves against that metric and so bringing this whole process into the digital world allows us to uh, kind of like they were talking about the process mining it allows us to dive into our process and understand exactly 
okay, which piece of the process is taking the most significant amount of time and lets us hone in on where we need to make, make uh, improvements. And so bringing all of this from the analog into the digital world back then has allowed us to continue to uh, improve our, our metrics where when we started this process in uh, several years ago, maybe our jobs took 14 days and uh, by having these data available, we're able to uh, make improvements and drive it down to you know, orders of magnitude improvement, like down to two days, three days, things like that. Well, I, I think you, you also talked about the, the customization aspect of uh, the business at Corvo, which you know, is really a, a huge challenge for a lot of manufacturing organizations. And you know, with manufacturing becoming more and more part of the digital economy, now, you know, the expectations of working faster, delivering faster, meeting these changing demands of customers is only increasing. Right. Um, when you look at sort of where, you know, Corvo's been thus far on the automation journey and then kind of looking at maybe near or midterm, you know, sort of the future roadmap, where do you see the automation journey kind of continuing next for the, the company? Right, we, we still have opportunities now, and it's fun to be here at uh, this conference because I'm getting ideas in my head, and okay, when I go back to the office, where are we going next? And from the things that we've digitized so far, a lot of them were automating, a lot of our, using our own internal systems where we use the Appian workflow tool to orchestrate these services that we created on our own. And through the workflow tool, we would just call whatever service we needed at the time. But now we've kind of uh, dwindled that list. Now there's other opportunities that things like uh, RPA or IDP uh, can help us with in this uh, external automation. So we often deal with people that are external to our company, whether they are our customers or our vendors, uh, where we have a lot of documents passing around. Uh, I saw a really great uh, session this morning in the, in the main room where there was that document being passed around, the IDP automatically pulling out the data, and then the RPA sending it to the next step. And then so we have a lot of those opportunities. So uh, I'm excited to see what we can do there. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, it, it really does draw a parallel to me. And I, I warned everybody I like data, I like statistics. So I'm going to share a little bit more. And, and this kind of comes from the uh, Manufacturing Leadership Council, which is uh, it's, a, it's a North American council made up of the largest manufacturers in North America, but it's also a global scope because these manufacturers are global. Um, and you know, I, I listen to Chris and I draw so many parallels with what you know, their membership says they're doing in this digitization and automation space. But you know, one of the things that I, I think is important for us to, to realize in the automation space that I, I see in this data from a trend standpoint is the top technology that comes out of the MLC that those manufacturers are interested in is digital twins. So I think there's two ways to think about the digital twin process. One is that you know, a lot of us think of digital twin as, for lack of a better example, maybe this image of a product and the ability to make change in an engineering way to you know, understand impacts of it. But I think it's also tr really important to to think about digital twin as a process digital twin, whether that be a, a shop floor operation, so think of the manufacturing floor as a digital twin, or the supply chain processes as a digital twin, or the, the full end-to-end -end as a digital twin. It really offers a, just a ton of decision-making power to organizations that go down this path. Because, I mean, think about how it raises the bar on risk management. Uh, it raises the bar on change management to be able to see those changes, uh, you know, whether it's from customer expectations that you're plugging in a difference or maybe, hey, I'm trying to mitigate what could happen in a, an area where I see a lot of risk in my supply base and I want to understand the upstream and, and downstream processes. So that's kind of the, the one that always floats to the top the last couple of years in the, uh, the factories of the future survey. Other uh, technologies are, that float to the top are ones that Chris mentioned. Um, you know, the RPA, IDP, um, you know, IoT always kind of floats to the top also. Um, machine, AI, machine learning is one of the top technologies that, um, 
that folks are, are interested in. And when you think about connected manufacturing, it's very difficult to really leverage some of like a machine learning or an AI machine learning technology if everything's sort of in these silos. So pulling that, connecting that information together, um, you know, brings that capability to life um, for companies. So I'm kind of looking at our time. I know I like to keep a little time check, <laughs> but I think we have, we have plenty of time for me to ask a couple more questions of, uh, of Chris. But, you know, with kind of where you've been and the perspective, listening to, you know, some of the, the you know, the experiences you've had at Corvo, the successes, you know, I, beyond those kind of capabilities, and, and you can also add these in if, if you really see them sort of, hey, these are still kind of a, a big part of what we need to do at, at Corvo. But what do you see as, you know, or get your perspective on what you see as the most critical capabilities that continue to, to be high priority to make better, faster day-to-day -day decisions or respond to those customizations uh, you know, those changing customer expectations uh, or customizations on a pretty rapid basis. Right, well, I think the one that comes to mind first is a team. So in order to use any kind of tool or have any kind of capability that you utilize, effectively having a good team is, is first and foremost. Um, and once you have a good team, what comes to mind next is to understand what are your capabilities versus what are your limitations. And I mentioned earlier, when we started our journey, we were a small engineering group. We knew we wanted some improvements. We didn't know exactly how to get there. Um, and it helps to know what you can do versus what you can't. So even today, when someone comes to us and say, hey, we have this uh, need for this new app, uh, here's the requirements and we would like it in this timeline. Well, if we have the tools that are available to us to meet those requirements, that helps to know. Does it, it helps to know do we have our own internal skill set to uh, deliver on what we're promising. And then even if you have the tools and the skill sets, the other is do you have the resources? Do you have the resources available to meet whatever timeline uh, that they're asking for? And it, even if you don't meet any of those things, it doesn't mean you're dead in the water. So it may just mean, well, instead of, for us, since we're our own internal development team, instead of us doing it, maybe we just need to go partner up with a, a partner or Appian to help get that kind of stuff done. And so those are the kind of capabilities that I think help us now meet uh, customer expectations. And then for the other part of the question, for the, uh, the, the surprises, the things that come up, I think a lot of it is a mindset. And so when you start these things, to be ready for things to change and then for there to be surprises. And then as long as you start out in the beginning to know that things are gonna change and know that you're gonna come across surprises, you won't ever be able to predict in the future every single thing that's gonna go wrong. But you can help uh, design, it can help drive your design to be agile and flexible. So when things do go off the path a little bit, it's not the end of the world you handle that thing, you get things back on course, and then there you go. Yeah, no, very good, very insightful. Um, kind of makes me want to ask you the, the, the next question, because you know, there are so many uh, organizations that are on different phases of an automation journey. Mm -hmm. And you know, with your experience, expertise, uh, the work that you've done at Corvo, you know, what advice would you have for you know, other, others that are either just beginning, you know, sort of at the front end of their automation or digitization journey, or those that are maybe in that initial phase of their, their journey. Right, so I tried to put myself in, what, what, was I, what was my mindset like back when I was in Appian World in Washington, D.C., trying to figure out what can this tool do for me, and what that path was like in, you know, in the unknown future. And the advice I would offer is, first off, it's, it can be scary and it can be intimidating, but that's okay. And just because it's scary and just because it's intimidating doesn't mean that the path forward you know, shouldn't be followed. And uh, the other thing is expect setbacks, expect failures. These setbacks and failures are part of the process. They're gonna come. 
Uh, and then when they come, the most critical thing is to take some lesson from that and, and learn from it and apply it to something in the future. I think I saw uh, the Netflix documentary of SpaceX recently, mm -hmm. and you know that's one of the things that they valued of uh, you know all the stuff that they learned, all the rockets they blew up, and they were kind of expecting to have failures because failures meant that you know, they learned from it, and at the end, uh, it was a much more valuable and uh, quality product that they delivered because they had those failures and because they learned from them. So when these failures come up, to learn from them is key and, and important. Yeah. No, very, very insightful. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, it just really kind of makes me think about some of those challenges that you know you've kind of led your team to overcome, um, and you know using the, the platform. But what I really get excited about, honestly, in with the Appian um, low code automation platform is when I think about the connected manufacturing strategy, the capabilities needed to actually make it come to life and deliver value, you know, these kind of conversations always sort of just reemphasize the fact that, you know, it delivers the technology and the capabilities that actually enable, you know, organizations to do that digitization, to do that automation work, to bring together those disparate systems, that siloed data processes across the, the enterprise. And, you know, I'll, I think one of the strong points there also is just the ability of being able to utilize the reusable components mm -hmm. as I build it to accelerate my journey along the path versus you know some of the traditional methods that tend to be long duration, high cost, and usually don't deliver what for you know, sure. You're after. In, in, even in the beginning of our of our journey, we were guilty of building components that weren't reusable, and we learned our lesson fast. And because if you have these opportunities to make reusable components and you don't take them. You're just setting yourself up for more maintenance and heartache in the future. So anytime you have the capability or the uh, you know, option to build these things that can be reused and make your life easier in the uh, future when you have a very similar type job, then yes. And then Appian does do that because nowadays with the the interfaces and the rules and uh, all of the different options that are available. We, are, we learned our lesson early on and now when we build, have the opportunity to build something that's reusable, we do and we take advantage of it. No, that's great. I mean, really appreciate you sharing those, those insights and, and experiences. And I think we have a few minutes uh, left where we could take some questions um, from those in the audience if anyone has any. Hi, thanks, Chris, for uh, joining us. I know you're pretty successful in running your practice, uh, Appian practice. A lot of companies uh, struggle to be independent. Uh, from Appian, once you purchase software, they're dependent on consulting services and implementation services from outside the company. How did you manage to be independent? What was your process of building your team? How did you find the talent? How did you train them? Tell, tell uh, the rest of us the secret. It was, there were some learning experiences definitely along the way. And I think it, being in that engineering background, for better or for worse, we have this mentality of, you know, we're smart, we can do it. And so when we started off that way, we knew we wanted to be independent on our own and self-sufficient. And we did utilize the, the training and the professional services from Appian to come to get us going uh, get us running, uh, and then we took off on our own. Mm -hmm. But not every organization has that. And I think it's better to know at the very beginning what do you as an org want to be? Because uh, to get to the, where we are now is not uh, cheap. You have to invest the resources, the full-time people, the training to keep them up with these skills. And so if that's not what you want to do, just it's better to say this is not what I want to do. And there's plenty of Appian partners out there that you can partner with to still meet your needs and you don't have to invest and create a whole mini Appian org in your uh, uh, group, so. Yeah. And then for hiring, it helps to be right next to UTD. We saw in the keynote that uh, they have <laughs> 
uh, the UTD has a program, and we haven't hired anyone in my group yet, but my, or my peer group, they already tapped into that, uh, oh, that's great. that portal, and it's really great that now you can just put a rec out there, and then bam, there's all of these qualified people out there. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I think we're at time, I believe, um, but if anyone has any questions, you know, please you know, look myself or, or Chris up during network breaks or maybe even the event. Uh, this evening, be more than happy to engage in some discussion and try and respond to your questions. I'd like to thank everyone for you know, your attendance to our session today, and a special thanks to you, Chris. Thank you, Gary, for sharing your expertise and insights, as well as the you know Corvo's experience along the automation journey. So, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.